Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis Show. On this episode, Nick Ripplinger, veteran, Army veteran. I always love having my Army brothers on because then we can talk in code and use, use funny abbreviations and things like that that nobody else understands. It's always fun to do that and make us sound smart. Nick, man, great to have you on the show. No, no, thanks for having me, guys. I truly appreciate it. So when, when I was doing my intro, and like I usually do, those of you who listen to me know that I always start running down some crazy road. So Nick is also founder of Battlesite Tech, which is, which is what really excites me because, well, there's a couple of things going on in those words. But uh, Nick, tell, tell us why Battlesite Tech, man. What, what's, what's going on there? Yeah, so our whole mission is to make the warfighters' mission safer, simpler, and more lethal. At the end of the day, that's all we care about. <clears throat> and we do that through uh, commercialization of products and really that rapid commercialization, right? When customers bring us ideas or if we come up with crazy ideas, get embedded by the customer, uh, end users, the warfighter, how quickly can we get that into their hands to make their mission safer, simpler, and more lethal? And we've really kind of niched ourselves in the infrared light spectrum, so stuff that we can see, but not the enemies. That's that's cool, and and uh, well, I won't go down that road of, of where a whole bunch of night vision goggles might be might be <laughs> used by somebody that, that we wouldn't want them used for. Uh, those of you who aren't paying attention to the world, that's Afghanistan. Uh, but what 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 I'm I would like to learn more about is. Why did you get into that? What was the thing that you sat back and, you know, I mean, back in the day you drove for the boss and you did, you did some close protection stuff and things like that. So what, what drove you to start a company that does, well, particularly right now, your IR tech stuff? Yeah. So it was really, it's kind of a crazy story how it all came to be is uh, we ended up licensing the for, first piece of technology from the air force. So they developed, some chemistry, they patented it, it was sitting on the shelf, we acquired the rights to it. But um, for Kratak, the first product, it's an infrared crayon, so you can write on any hard surface that lights up an IR light. It's a way to kind of dynamically communicate on the battlefield. And in my time in Iraq and Afghanistan, we were using chem lights like crazy, like blowing mm -hmm. through a thousand of them a month or something ridiculous. But you it's just a static piece of communication device. There's something there. I don't know. Is that a hazard? Is that the way we're supposed to go? And it kind of made the TTPs a little confusing. So now you can, you know, draw an arrow or you can mark it. And we, <clears throat> in my time in like 2007, we were cutting the tips off of chem lights, trying to communicate with them and it just didn't work. So really, you know, having would have had to been a customer of, a product like this was really where that motivation and like strong desire came from to run a thousand miles an hour. So I, I just, I'm, I'm laughing with this image of a bunch of Joes with their hula knives out trying to cut the top off of the Kim light and save the liquid. Those of you who don't know Kim light, think of it as like a plastic tube. It's got this liquid in there and it's got a glass cylinder. And the way you activate it, you break it and it breaks the glass cylinder and the chemicals cause, it, it does a chemical thing and it glows right there. there. I was going to say, I, I know I'm the civilian here, but ain't that just a glow stick? Is that fancy yeah, glow stick? Yeah. Glow stick. <laughs> <laughs> They're not even that fancy. It's just a glow stick, man. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. You're just, just, you know, you go to like the state fair at night and they're selling those things. That's mm -hmm. what they're selling is chem lights. So just imagine... A bunch of 18, 19 year olds out there with their big hula knives trying to mm -hmm. cut the top off so that then they can use it to write things. And uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> and that's exactly what we were doing. And it's yeah. I, I don't know if this is video recorded or not, but like the way you just like physically describe it is exactly how that went. Yeah, I, I know, because uh, I've done that for other reasons, more <laughs> in jest and uh, <laughs> pranks. <laughs> Then in uh, usefulness with them. <laughs> so so you started this company. How did you how did you set a vision for for battle site? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, our vision statement is very simple, and I'll probably murder it now. And I probably should. <laughs> the pressure's heart, on, boss. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, 
so personally, like I got medically retired in 2011. I felt like my career got cut short. They were still fighting, you know, in Iraq, Afghanistan and uh, Africa at the time. And like, <clears throat> like a part of me, I felt like I lost during that whole time because, you know, my brothers and sisters were still over there fighting. And I was, you know, back here in Ohio, chilling, trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life. And so really the motivation and the driving force behind it was the way to stay in the fight and still have an impact and, you know, still be helpful on the front lines, even though I'm old and broken now and work behind a desk most of the days. You know, what's your, uh, I'm, I'm really curious, crap, there's one dead, uh, of the you always ideation get at least process. one a show. I know, you always get I know which one. <laughs> To, to fill you in, Nick, we are uh, trying to stop saying curious. Uh, it's a dirty word for us because we've been saying uh, it too damn much. So we keep <laughs> score between the two of us. Uh, but I'm curious. So there's two. Um, uh, what the kind of ideation process is, you were talking some about, you know, talking with customer, getting customer feedback. Uh, what's that process like as far as getting the feedback and then, you know, putting that into your next round of products? Yeah. And honestly, that's like my favorite part of my job, right? You go out to, you know, a team room or you're working with these, you know, special operators and usually there's some beer involved or bourbon or something along those lines. And you're just sitting there. And like my favorite question to ask them is what sucks about your job and how can we make it better? Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff like we can't fix through products. We can't fix through. I'm just not smart enough to go out and solve that problem. But usually there's something super low tech, super simple, like a crayon or um, we do an infrared C dye marker. The chemistry is super complex, but at the end of the day, right, we're building crayons. Um, and then like being able to incorporate, like for Craytac prime example, right? We designed it only with that close quarters combat room clearing, clearing a house mindset. But now medics are using it and EOD, the bomb disposal guys are using it and taping it to their boots and putting breadcrumbs to the potential bomb site that, you know, hey, if you follow these dots, you're not going to get blown up. And we have the smartest customers in the world. I mean, they are true problem solvers and they will make do with whatever they have. And, you know, taking that feedback is, like I said, my favorite part of the job because they're always coming up with you know, better ideas and better improvements than we would ever come up with because they're still on the front lines and they're doing this training and they're doing these missions and always come back inspired and just want to hit the ground running of, hey, we have to incorporate this change like now because it solves X, Y, and Z problem for this customer base. And that's really the driving force for us. You know, we always call it uh, on the show uh, garage innovation, where it's yeah. like the people who are actually doing the job are the ones who are going to figure out the best ways to, you know, fix those problems. And then the question is always what, you know, how do you scale that? How do you get that out of, out of other people? Uh, so, damn it, I just said curious again. Crap. Gosh, I'm off today. You're losing um, but, the day, buddy. <laughs> I, know, I know. I've already lost. So I'll just keep saying it. Uh, I'm curious what, uh, when you get in there, how hard is it to select out the ideas that you can actually do something about? Because you mentioned that there's things that are, you know, outside of your capabilities, but then there's also going to be the things that feel like they're inside your capabilities, but probably would take way too much time. So how, how do you sort through that? Yeah, it, you know, I think there's a huge difference. We talk about this all the time here at the shop between innovation and customization and not to pick on our SEAL brothers and sisters or brothers, but like they love the customization of, hey, tweak this 45 degrees because it's the way I like it in my hand. Like, mm -hmm. how do you filter out what's customization versus what actually improves the product for the largest population? So kind of not answering your question at all there, but <laughs> back to your question. Uh, I think it's just, you have to be self-aware, right? Of, mm -hmm. hey, you know, we're really good at these five things and we really suck at these 10,000 things. We have a lot of contacts in those other areas that we can either bring into the project, you know, outsource it through us, or sometimes it's just so far out of our wheelhouse. It's like, hey, man, I'm not going to build you a satellite, but we work with this company here that puts sensors on satellites all the time. Happy to make that introduction and see if, you know, they might have a solution to your problem. And like at the end of the day, we only care about solving problems, right? So the only reason we're in business is to solve problems. And being self-aware to know that, hey, maybe we're not the right people to solve this problem, but having that bigger, larger network of, hmm. I feel like we still solve the problem. Maybe we just put the customer in contact with somebody else who could potentially solve their problem. 
Yeah, exactly. It's, it's that selflessness that I think a lot of people forget about with, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and business leaders is that it's like when you really care about your mission, when you care about your vision, you care about solving that problem. You don't really care if you're the one who actually gets paid for it. You just want to solve the problem. You just want to. Yeah, help. absolutely. And, you know, if they want to bring us on as a consultant or some aspect to help kind of bridge that gap, because I think at least in the military sector, I think Otis kind of hit on it in the intro, right? We get to use our acronyms and we get to talk in our own little code language that, you know, bringing in some a company or an organization that has that experience and just being able to translate some of the conversations. Like the same way, like you think back to this conversation, we were talking about Kim lights, you know, like, hey, you're, you really mean a glow stick, right? And just having somebody there to kind of like broker those conversations of what's being mm -hmm. said versus what they mean in civilian terms has been, I mean, there's always opportunities out there, I guess. I, I want to open this up to both of y'all. Uh, just it's, is that information gap something that's really prevalent and has created a lot of issues to where it's, you know, like the army needs something, but they can only call it an acronym. And so the people they're working with, you know, I know it's a funny example of it, but is that, is that an information gap, you know, a big problem as far as innovation in the uh, armed forces? I'm not sure I'd say it's a big problem, but I definitely feel like there's a language barrier there. There's a language barrier. And then there's also, I think, a, 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 a maybe a time barrier or there, there's a there's a gap that, you know, the guy on the ground, like like Nick said earlier, these these guys, they figure out stuff. I mean, I, I, I remember I remember in Alaska, one of my soldiers came up with a way to pull tent stakes out of frozen ground. So we had these big steel tent stakes that you drive into the permafrost. Well, you, you drive something into the permafrost, it melts it, then it refreezes and, you know, Mother Earth grabs that tent stake. So the tent stakes don't come out of the ground. Well, he figured out a way of making like a little fulcrum thing. And I mean, it was, it was cool, but it was just, you know, an epitome to those, or, or a testament, a testament to those soldiers. And it, you know, you can go back throughout history, those soldiers who are out there figuring out how to make something better with what they have. And that's, that's what's really cool. But then what Nick's talking about is he's coming in and, and listening to those problems and saying, oh, well, if we had this sort of a widget or that sort of a widget, then we could do, you could, you wouldn't have to, you know, buy glow, you know, take your daughter's glow sticks on, on deployment or, or whatever, you know, in that sort of sense. Uh, but I got to jump back to something that you, that you touched on because it's, 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 these two things are such a key element, I, I believe, for business success, particularly when you're starting off, is one, know what you do, and two, live in abundance. And that, yeah. and that's what you're doing. You, you know, this is my lane. This is where we're the best at. And if you need these things over here and over there, I got a guy, but it ain't me. Yeah. And I think, so I gave a talk to some college students yesterday and somehow like talked on how I manage some personal stuff, but it applies incredibly well to business. And I think it was an old Green Beret who uh, taught me this is I have a spreadsheet of three columns, what I'm good at, what I love, what I suck at. And I choose to focus on that middle column, outsource everything on that far right column of what I suck at, right? Because I'm not good at it. I'm not going to do a good job at it. I can bring somebody into my life to, you know, fill those gaps. And then a lot of what I'm good at and what I love overlap. And those are really the areas where I choose to focus my time. Even though I'm good at some stuff, I still outsource it because there's just people who are passionate about, you know, legal stuff or spreadsheets or whatever is on that list that I'm decent at that I don't love doing. And I think, like, I think being self-aware of who you are as a person, who you are as a leader and who you are as a business person, you kind of need those, you know, three buckets for every aspect of that life. Uh, that's, that's great. And you just gave me my, my opportunity because I haven't used this word in a long time. Uh, ikigai. <laughs> so Ikigai is a Japanese philosophy. It was started in, on the island of uh, Okinawa right around this time, same time, at least according to the historical stuff I've read, Around the same time that karate came into being as a philosophy of martial arts. 
And what Ikigai is, is taking what you just said, those three things, and, and taking it to the next step, adding in, a, a, making a Venn diagram of what are you good at? What do you love to do? What does the world need? And then the fourth one is what will people pay you for? And we're all four of those circles overlap that that sort of four circle Venn diagram. That's your Ikigai. So yeah, no, that's what, a great way to visualize it. Yeah, and that's and that's what you're doing with just by having those those three columns in your mind, you're moving towards that already. And I mean, quite frankly, you're obviously still in business. So I that that would say that the world needs it and somebody <laughs> paying for it too. So yeah, I can't complain on that front. And I mean, I I can't stress this enough. Working with the military, we truly have the best customers in the world. You know, one of one aspect to the ikigai type concept that I think people miss, and I actually was talking with a friend of mine uh, yesterday about this, is, you know, you continue to ask why when you talk about what you want to do. It's like, okay, well, why do you want to do that? Why is that important to you? All that kind of stuff. I think the why that people miss is the why you. Why are you the one to solve that kind of problem? What, you know, what makes your talents, your skills, whatever it is, your passions, uh, you know, special fit to go solve this problem, to go fulfill your purpose for the world, however you want to word it. Uh, so Nick, I want to throw that over to you. Why you, why are you the right person to solve this problem? Because to your point again, dad, it's clearly working. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, like, I don't have a great answer. I won't lie. I'm kind of blindsided by this one, but you know, I'm, not, right. I'm not sure I'm the best guy for this. To be honest with you, I think there's people way smarter. I think there's, you know, better innovators out there. I think there's better connected people, but this is what drives me. This is what I wake up for every morning. I can't wait to get to the office. I'm usually working late into the night and it, it doesn't feel like work because it's mm -hmm. what I enjoy doing. It's the passion that drives us here. So that is the. That is the humble answer I always expect from a business leader. And if they don't answer it that way, then it's a bad sign. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't have a great answer for you, man. No, that is a great answer. That's what I mean. That's because the best, the best leaders, the best CEOs uh, are the people who recognize what they know and what they don't know, just like you were talking about earlier and recognizing where your passions are, where your skills are and all that kind of stuff. Because for a lot of people, they can have the best skills in the world for solving that problem. But if it feels like work to them, they ain't going to solve it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I was just going to say, so one of the things, and, and then the other stumbling block, because in the uh -huh. army, you don't really get too much of a choice of this, of who comes on your team, right? Mm -hmm. You get a little bit, you know, depending on, depending on where you are and the organizations and things like that. Once you step out into the business world, it's Ali Ali all come free. So how do you, how are you as the the guy in charge finding the right those right people? You know to kind of go back into that flow of what Camden was just talking about. Yeah, I think a lot of it's been dumb luck for us to be honest with you, and like putting out like being vulnerable and saying, "Hey, I need somebody that can solve this." And then again, if you have a wide network and you stay in contact and you can drive value for your network, they're going to drive value for you. So back in the beginning days, we got a venture capital offer. Um, and I didn't know how to build the financials that they were looking for. Like we had some rudimentary financials and we were tracking everything, but it wasn't super robust and didn't have all these assumptions and weighted values and all this stuff that I just didn't know at the time. That's how we got connected to our CFO. Uh, he's been with us basically from day one of, since that offer. Then as we started to grow, we brought on some technicians. Um, super big on hiring vets here. So that worked out well, working with the transition units here and, you know, family contacts. And then came to time that we've reached a growth point and we need to be a little more compliant on the contractual deliverables and the documentation. And we got to work with one of our customers who expressed some interest in going out into industry. And so we were able to snag her. And then our director of technology is a PhD and probably like one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life uh, was a sub to us on a project and we really hit it off. And I was like, he'd be a perfect fit if we could ever hire him. And we took like two or three runs to get him, but we finally got him on board. And I think the biggest thing of being a small team and, you know, kind of with your background, Otis, I'm sure hopefully you agree with this, but, you know, one bad apple on a small team can totally wreck the culture and wreck the productivity. So 
you know, we are such a firm believer to hire for the cultural fit first, the skills second, and then knowing that, hey, we're willing to invest and train you and get you educated or whatever it needs to happen to get those skills up there. But as long as you're a right culture fit and you're going to show up every day and you're going to love what you do and you're motivated, all that other stuff works itself out. Oh, it's so true. Fit is, fit is always, should always be your first thing. You know, I had this conversation with a, actually a, a fellow that I'm, you know, kind of flip the coin and flip it the other way. You know, you're going in, he's going in to look at a business to see if that's a good fit for him. You, you've got to look at it both ways. And I, I say this to my, my, my uh, well, anybody really, I mean, what, you don't have to be a veteran to be in this position. When you're looking at that job, whether you're the hiring manager or the potential candidate, you got to make sure it's a fit, man, because either way, if it ain't, good luck. You're just yeah. going to be, you're going to be that person. Holy crap. It's only 1030 and I got to stay here till five, you know? Exactly. I think like, I love when we interview people because it's not, it's more of us selling the company on the candidate versus the other way around. And that's how I think that should be. I don't think that's how it always is out in the industry, but I, to your point, right. It's gotta be a right fit for both sides. And if it's not a right fit on either side, both the organization and that potential candidate aren't going to be successful to the way that they could be. You know, there's, there's one thing that, and I, I may be off with this, but you know, you said it a few times, Nick, uh, you know, you work with the best customers in the world. Uh, you love working with the soldiers, working with the army. Uh, is there, is there a little bit of an issue or issue might not be the right word, but I'm going to, I'm going to run through this of, uh, you know, going through with the contracting world, the bureaucracy and that type of things, because I I've heard this from people we've had on the show that, you know, there's like the small team aspect that you love about your time in the military, but there's also the whole, you know, big army thing, which no one really seems to love much. So yeah. how, how has that been from more the entrepreneur side? From the entrepreneur. So honestly, we've had extremes on both ends, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, we landed a contract like two years ago that we got paid 60% upfront within 10 minutes of contract award. Like it was that fast. Wow. Like, we were in one room, we walked to another room, we signed the contract, we walked to another room and got paid 60% of the contract value. So one extreme of it works super well and you get paid up front and everything like that to the other extreme where we got notified, hey, we're going to award you this contract. And it took 13 months mm -hmm. from that time to the time that we actually signed the contract and then another 45 days for the first payment. And that was super early on in battle sites history. And on, honestly, it almost bankrupted the company because we knew we had this contract. It was fairly significant, but it took over a year to get across the finish line. But yeah, I'd say on average, it's, yeah. I don't know, 60 to 90 days for notification, another 30 days for contracting, and then 30 to 45 days to first payment. So you're still looking at, you know, almost six months. How does that play in uh, to the operations of a business? This is just, you know, different than a lot of people's businesses are set up as far mm -hmm. as that kind of cyclical nature. Yeah, I think it, it forces you to be super disciplined and it forces you to get really smart at managing cash. And like, I think most entrepreneurs are driven by the value they're delivering and they just want to run a thousand miles an hour where with on the contracting side, you got to be disciplined because you know, hey, we just won this contract. It could be six months before we start getting payments for it. So mm. how do you manage kind of the staffing for that effort? How do you manage, wait, we want a contract. I, I want to get started today, right? <laughs> this is super cool. If you could shave that six months, it's six months faster. We have products in the people's hands and it's, you know, six months that they're not dealing with this capability gap. Mm -hmm. But luckily I've got an awesome CFO and COO who keep us really disciplined on that front. Yeah, that's, that is a, uh, a, a point that, you know, if you're working outside of the government, I don't think, I don't think it happens quite as much because, you know, you get success and you just kind of run and you got cash in the bank, right? Uh, I've got money in the bank, got money in the bank. Okay. Make payroll. Yeah. I got enough. All right. And then mm -hmm. you just keep running. But in this case, what's really unique about it is, you know, you know, this, this isn't that, you know, the facetious sort of checks in the mail. The check really is in the mail. The government never renicks. 
Yeah. Knock on wood. But, you know, that's still out there, whether it's 45 days or six months or whatever. <laughs> Man, there's some there's some tightening up of the britches uh, that goes on in order to do that. And and as a as the business leader, the CEO, you've got to be tracking that cash flow to project out because, yeah, you may get ten million dollars, 45 days into it. But boy, <laughs> getting from today to that 45 days can be pretty rough sometimes. Yeah. Um, luckily, we got a small staff. We're only like eight people right now, but still, that's a fairly large payroll. Like, at least to us, it feels huge. But to your point, like, you know, especially them these large chunks type of payment things when your revenue is super spiky and not just kind of a gradual line up over the year. And I, I think it really just comes down to discipline. I think the military, my military experience really helped, like, understand, all right, it's going to suck this month. And we're going to not go out and buy that piece of equipment that we want to have on the floor for day one until it comes in. But yeah, well, it's it's uh, it's Ranger School. Here's your yeah. three MREs for the next six days. You know, it's it's that sort of thing, and you know, it just reminds me. I, I think it, it it's it feels like it was a Dave Ramsey thing, but you know, Dave Ramsey about being debt free. You know, he, he talks about it with people, but it also on the business mindset of of putting in the bank and having. I think it was, uh, gosh, it was at least ninety days of payroll set aside think about that as a business leader that that adds up i mean eight people yes it's not this gazillion money but you know you got a hundred folks how are you going to make payroll if that you know that award is there but it ain't been paid yet because it's a net 45 or or even you know 20 years ago it was a net 90 you know think about that so uh and yeah, and banks hate to lend against government contracts for whatever reason so like now you're losing a lot of capability that most commercial large size businesses have access to. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do you handle that with the team? When you, when you got to, you know, you see it because this comes up a lot with business leaders, you know, it's, it's the, the old, how much do I share? How do, how do you do that to keep your team in, you know, informed and whatever you want to call it? Yeah. So we celebrate every win with the team because we know it wasn't just you know one person who put this proposal together and won this work so we definitely go out and celebrate even the smallest of wins um just kind of keep morale high and then we try super transparent on a lot of stuff about the business but anything that could potentially affect them negatively like we're just not going to fail right we just have that mindset of we're not going to fail and yeah there's been times where payroll has been close but we've never missed a payroll so unless it's in stone there's no way we're going to pull this together or, well you know the owners aren't going to throw in more cash this month to cover it or bridge loan or something like that then we have that conversation but i don't think it's you know fair to potentially scare somebody over an issue that's not going to happen yeah. right it's kind of that whole thing you praise in public and discipline in private right it's the discipline here is any bad news like that's not the employees problems to worry about that's you know the owners and the c-suite team and all you know, right those are the burdens that we have to carry and we need to shield our team from those no that, that's that's spot on i love that too because you know you're the one that loses sleep about whether or not you got enough cash in the bank account to make payroll tomorrow morning right that's yeah. you know that's that's the owner who who who's the one who loses sleep over that and you yeah you know, when you when you can't make it, that's when you tell the team. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, and they don't need to know. I want to add this. on there. There's a balance there of you know it's like what what specific information are you showing to your team? Because you know we've talked about it before how you want your team to be incentivized to where they're understanding where the business is at and they want to help it grow. You know everyone sees that sales number every morning. We talk about businesses that are like that, but so you're showing that sales number. You're not showing whether or not you're going to make that next payroll because that's yeah. a scary freaking thing for them. You want them to be looking at that sales number, be motivated by that incentive, but you don't want them to be so racked up over the idea that you're not going to make payroll and they're not going to be able to pay their rent and all these type of things that they're going to spiral out of. Exactly. Yeah, I think it, yeah, I think you hit that one pretty well. 
Don't don't boost them up too much. Come All on. All right, my bad. <laughs> they definitely could have done better, Cam. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's I'm what sorry, I got to see here. <laughs> I'll, I'll hit some push-ups. Come back. <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on. He's he's throwing out college college education at us still. <laughs> got to. He's got to get some more, a couple more knots on his head and not from, <laughs> rugby, but from business. So, hey, so I want to jump back to, to army days. Cause I always yeah. love this question is, is what's a leadership lesson that you learned or picked up or, or your drill sergeant hit you upside the head with that you still fall back on today? So I, I really think there's two. One is that preparation is key. Um, you know, and the stuff we've done in the military and the more you train, the more you rehearse, the more muscle memory, the less likely shit's going to go wrong. So I think preparation is always a big one. And then two, the communication, right? Be super clear on goals, objectives, um, communicate the good stuff and then also communicate the bad stuff. And I think, you know, investing time and energy into your team and knowing you know, I can yell at Otis, but that doesn't work with Cam. And really, truly, that personal aspect of finding effective ways to communicate with different people on the team. So uh, as you're working with your team and building it up, uh, how, I'm trying to think how to word this, how, have, how has it been building up that culture? Because you talked about hiring a lot of vets. So that's, there's a little bit of a natural head start that you have there, but uh, how, how have you worked to build that kind of a culture for your team? You know, we talk so much about culture, but I don't feel like we spend a lot of time or energy on the culture, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. we know what the culture is. We know what it, we want it to be. And we know we want to bring people in that match that culture. And it kind of just works itself out to some extent. I'm sure there's probably way smarter people that will disagree with that, but you know, we've been very fortunate that we took our time, we did our due diligence, we hired the right people that kind of emulate the culture that we already had built and established. And I think, you know, we've got super open concept office space, mostly because we ran out of money when we did the build out for this new shop. But it also just, there's- You couldn't afford the scared. interior walls, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it just- it allows for that constant communication of, Hey, if I got a question, I don't have to walk down a hallway and knock on somebody's door. Right. I look across the room and say, Hey, Sonny, what's, what's the status on this? Or, Hey, Ryan, I think we should do this. And it just works. And I think, you know, not having the cube walls or office walls and mostly because we saved a lot of money on the build out, but also because it just facilitates that natural kind of culture. And I don't, you know, in the military, they always talked about like the open door policy and stuff. Like we just mm -hmm. don't have a door, like <laughs> super simple. Right. So the team's here in some of the C-suite conversations, we're here in some of the team conversations and it just, it works for us. And the fact that yeah, we have a police think, bar for the end of the day to kind of hash out anything that went right or went wrong also yeah. helps. Well, you know, I think you hit on something really, really interesting there. Uh, what it reminds me of, and I think I'm getting this from a comedian, uh, but I think it's a very true thing. And uh, I've heard it with a few different examples, but it's like in a relationship, in a marriage, you know, uh, finances are only 10% of a relationship, unless it's bad, then it's 90% of the relationship. I feel like culture is the same type of thing to where it's like, if you have a good company culture and things are working, yeah, you really shouldn't be talking about it that much because it's just happening. And then when it's really bad, that's when it's 90% of your problem. Yeah, no, I think that's very true. And so like, hopefully we don't screw it up and it becomes 90%. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, you know, I'm, I'm always a big fan of uh, talking about culture and diving into to how it became and, you know, what it is and you know, all these definitions of it. But when you're a small business like this, this is the best time to establish it because culture is is its own beast. It's one of those... If you don't pay attention to it, then it can create, you can have a culture that is just, you know, toxic to use that, that word that gets thrown around all the time out there and not even know it. You know, you every so often you, you read something about some CEO who knew about some sort of derelict things going on in the business and it all boils down to culture in that business and the lack of awareness of that leader 
or that person that was in a leadership position, I should say, yeah. uh, who, who didn't know what was going on. And as long as you have your thumb on it as the leader, as the guy who's, who's you know, the, the business is from you, you know, then the culture becomes, well, it is you and it fits with you. So as long as you, and I'm saying this, not just not pointing at you, Nick, but in the general sense of, of uh, business leaders, as long as you're involved in it and aware of it and then going, okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You don't always, you know, there, there's a point where, you know, you start to get more folks in your team, then you got to have a little bit more definitive. And it's not, you know, because I like to refer to it as you, you've gotten past the, uh, the kitchen table size of your business right and that's that's mm -hmm. kind of where y'all are at you know it's it's the kitchen table size of the business and then it's really man tight knit and that's where it's man that's running and gunning and a lot of fun and i bet you that and that kind of leads me to where where i'm going with this really long diatribe of of the energy level in that shop must just be must must be rewarding like 90 yeah. percent of the time it's through the roof, to be honest with you. It's great. Um, like from the lowest level technician all the way up to myself, everybody just shows up and it's super motivating. Well, they're all super motivated, which is super motivating to me. And then it, it's got that trickle down or up effect, however, it, mm -hmm. the ripple effect, we'll call it, mm -hmm. of yep. where when one employee has a win, it brings the whole spirit up of the shop. Like it might just be an experiment that we didn't screw up this time and it actually ran through, or it could be a new idea that, you know, or a new patent that got issued or a new contract. And it truly is a, you know, a family feel. I think a lot of that has to do with our size, but that's really what we want to keep the focus on and make sure that we, if we grow to a hundred people that we don't lose that family feel and that we can all feed off of each other and be there when, you know, shit just doesn't work out, which, you know, when you're talking about scientific experiments and innovation, like stuff is going to fail and that's all right. Like get to fail fast and move on to the next project. You know, there's, there's one other aspect on the, you know, innovation and uh, creativity side that I, don't think we've touched on yet. And uh, we talked about this a bunch, uh, Dad, if you remember the Dr. Quello episode uh, about how a lot of innovation comes from, you know, there's two different types of innovation. It's the person who is young in the field and new to it and doesn't understand it. So they don't believe in the BS rules that everyone else follows. And there's the person who's been working it their entire life, chipping away at things. And, you know, you were talking that you don't have that kind of an expertise necessarily, you know, you don't have a chemistry degree and all these different types of stuff. Uh, do you... Do you kind of bring that like, hey, why don't we try this? Hey, what if this type of energy to the team? And uh, how do they respond to that? Because I, in my experience, that type of a leader can bring some really, really, really good innovation if the team trusts them enough to go, hey, no, that's a stupid idea, Nick. We're going to go on to the next one. So honestly, I think it's a little bit of both, um, to be honest with you. Um, we fully encourage, you know, anybody who's got an idea, like, let's go run the experiment, find out. Like, I don't know. Like I have a gut feel like, yeah, it's going to be an epic fail, but go run it, find out, like mm -hmm. prove me wrong. And I think also there's been times where, you know, the C-suite team is very hands-on in the lab was, hey, we should try this. And people are kind of being skeptics. Like, I don't think that's going to work. Well, just run it, find out, go print the part or go, you know, mix some chemicals together. Like it's all right if it fails rule it out, put it on the whiteboard or in a notebook somewhere. Yeah. Don't do that again. But yeah. for, like, what well, it's going to take two hours of time to set it up and we're going to use some equipment overnight and we're going to have an answer in the morning one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we've all been surprised the stuff that's worked and we, there's been stuff I would have bet my whole life savings on that would work that just doesn't. And mm -hmm. being comfortable with, you know, spending that little bit of money to get to the answer like I'd rather get to an answer and not guess if that's, you know, a possible solution or not. I, What's I love the biggest the, exciting thing like that, you know, or, or the, it's like that worked. Holy yeah. <laughs> Those are my favorite busy? days here. I'm like, Holy shit. This opens up all these other possibilities. Yeah. Run it again and make sure we just stay on a fluke, but that's pretty like, it's always a great day in the shop and something like that happens. So can you describe one to us? tell us the story uh, yeah so we're playing around with the die right now for a, a project 
that is not light stable. Like it just disappears in the shop. Mm -hmm. Um, but we've been mixing some other dyes with it, not thinking that was going to change the light stability, but it did and it made the product that much brighter. And now it's probably going to end up moving into production here in next month. That's awesome. It, yeah. it reminds me of this actually, what I was about to say was, you know, people forget when they talk about inventing and all this kind of stuff, uh, people forget how many things that we use every day were invented on accident. And oh, yeah. it was a, you know, you put these two chemicals together because you're thinking you're going to make, you know, uh, something that's going to work perfect for your business. And then it turns out you make something completely different. It's like, all right, well, now we got to start working on that on the side. You know, that's a whole nother, you know, that's a cash cow over there if we transition it that way. But it was a complete yeah. accident. It happens all the time. And the one that really jumps out to me like that is uh, my favorite household appliance, the Roomba, right? I walk out the door, I push a button, my house is vacuuming when I get home. Like that came from a military technology for EOD with uh, some sort of robotics for disabling bombs, right? Huge fail on that. However, it turned into, you know, a gazillion dollar business or however big Roomba is. And that's had an immediate impact on my life because it's my favorite household appliance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do, do you have a name for your Roomba? Uh, the kids call it DJ Roomba because we have like an older version and it's in crazy, like crazy loud. <laughs> <laughs> DJ Roomba. Love that. Love that. So uh, where is Battleside going next, man? What, what's, what's, what's the vision? So we actually had a strategy session around this this morning. I'm super excited. Um, we've got, you know, Craytac and Cold Fire that are getting ready for commercial launch as soon as we get past this pandemic and can start hitting trade shows again. We've got about eight other projects all in various stages of development and kind of like pulling us up that technology curve, if you would, from crayons to lasers and optics and some really interesting, unique products that are solving some pretty specific mission sets. And I think 22 is going to be a fun year traveling with the customers and out there testing and shooting stuff and blowing stuff up and, you know, communicating with nods and satellites and aircraft and I think I don't I don't think the team's ever been more motivated going into a new year than we are right now. That's cool. And that's exciting. And I'll just let you know if you never need any help with uh, blowing things up. Just keep <laughs> it out. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I still remember my formula that I learned a long time ago. P for plenty. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that, that's uh, <laughs> sorry. That's that's my old go to. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it still works, and I, I tell you, my my uh, SF team sergeant and my my uh, senior engineer, yeah, they still <laughs> use P for plenty. I don't care how much trade we had. <laughs> yeah, this is. I tell you what, Nick, this has been good stuff. Uh, I'm I'm excited to to see where Battleside Tech goes, man, and that's I, I love I love the innovation and the culture you've created, and 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 how. You know, like like I've said uh, many times before, you're giving back to the regiment, uh, sort of sort of sense. You know, you're not not just out there crunching out a, a dollar and you know making you know making your house payments or paying off your house, all those sort of things that get into the greed greed mind. But you're you're serving a purpose with it, so that's really cool, man. I appreciate that. Well, I'm happy to. I mean, I love showing up to work every day. That's awesome. That's awesome. So. Which, which leads me to my, my favorite uh, segue question and, and the what did you learn? And, and uh, you know, I hadn't looked back at my notes in a minute, so I've already forgotten what I wrote down is what I learned. So, Camden, you get to go first. You well, thought I was going to pull back, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> well, I got, I got a funny one, and I'm not totally sure you were right on this, Dad. Uh, but you said, Ollie, Ollie, all come free. And I have said that a hundred times playing games as a kid. And that's not what I thought those words were. And I wrote it out and I see it now, but I thought it was like Ollie, Ollie oxen free or something like, just like, you know, gibberish. So uh, that's a, that is a funny little game of te generational telephone that's been happening. apparently. Yeah. <laughs> generational telephone, man. Uh, for me. Yeah. That's, that's hard to beat a, a funny one like that. Ollie, 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 Ollie. Now I can't even say it. I'll be, I'll be uh, no wonder you no no wonder you didn't learn how to say it right because I can't say it right anymore. Uh, you know, 
I think it's uh, the the close interaction with the client. You know, it's the getting down and understanding what the client's problem is. And because you know what, I can I can say and I can point and I can say this is this is the problem, this is the problem. But for the client, for you to ask and listen to the client and them tell you, here's my problem. This is, this is, here's the gap. And I need something to fill that gap. And then you provide something like that because you listen, actually listen to your client as opposed to, nah, this is what you need. You need, you need 16 more of these Yeti, Yeti mugs and that'll solve all your problems. Right. So that, 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 for me is is always a good foot stomper reminder for everybody out there that listen to your clients and give them what they need don't give them what you think they need yeah 100 percent. i couldn't agree more with that so nick what'd you learn <clears throat> you know i'm honestly going to go back to my desk and uh research what we talked about with those venn diagrams and try to get a little more disciplined and a little more structured of writing that stuff down and keeping a little closer eye on it so really looking forward to learning more about that. Uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, uh, another book that uh, I'm about halfway through, if you kind of do the the Asian philosophy, you know, kind of dabble in that. I, I do a lot of stoicism, but I also dabble in the Asian philosophy. It's called The Way and the Power. It's really an interesting book, too. I'm about, yeah, probably about halfway through that one. So it's uh, pretty cool also. Well, hey, man, this is this has been great, Nick. Uh, how do people connect with you, learn more about what's going on at Battlesite? Yeah, so battlesitetech.com. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook. Uh, my cell phone number's everywhere, so. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's yeah. good and bad sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. But uh, the email address is out there on the website as well. So awesome. if there's ever anything I can do, feel free to reach out. Awesome, man. Well, hey, we really appreciate you carving out some time today. Uh, like I said, I'm excited to, to see what's going to happen with Battlesite in the next next uh, handful of months because y'all got some cool stuff going on. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Camden, run us out. All right. Thank you all for listening to today's show. Special thanks to our guest, Nick Ripplinger, for joining us today and our sponsor, Tribe and Purpose. Find your tribe, find your purpose. You can check out recent episodes of the Cam Hinota Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and check out a full archive at thecaminotashow.buzzsprout.com. The Cam Hinota Show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next week.